All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Christine Brinza, and I'm the Senior Curator and James and Louise Glasser Curator of Art of the American West at the Tucson Museum of Art. This is a new series called Cookies with the Curator, where I have conversations with artists, colleagues, and other arts professionals. What better way to talk about art than have a cookie? So today, my guest is Sean Huckins. He's a Denver-based artist whom I've had the pleasure of working with over the past year on a previous exhibition. So welcome, Sean. Hi, thank you for having me. So this is Cookies with the Curator, as you know. And so we start off with our love of sweets. Absolutely. What kind of cookie do you have today? Well, I couldn't choose. I'm a, I'm a big sweets fan. I love sweets. That's my vice. So I have two. Okay. I have, I have the classic chocolate chip cookie. Ooh. But I like, uh, I prefer mine with dark morsels, like dark chocolate morsels versus the standard milk chocolate. And then my other go-to is a very simple one as well, ginger snaps. Ooh, I nice. Up, yeah, I grew up with these in New England. And they just remind me of fall time, the crisp fall air. So these are huge in my household. <laughs> okay. So do you yeah. make them or? Uh, I usually do, but I was kind of pressed for time for this meeting. So I, I bought this one. Oh, so, okay. I know. Well, if I you usually... have a recipe you want to share, we can always, you know, send it out on our platform for anyone interested. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I got the... The uh, ginger snap recipe from my sister-in-law, who was like a little house in her prairie mom. Like she just makes her kids clothes. She farms. She just knows everything about cooking. So she cooks on a 112-year-old stove, like those old black stoves they made back in the 1800s. Like, yeah, she's like complete farm girl. Oh, wow. That recipe that I use is from her, and they're just the bomb. They're the best. <laughs> oh, man, I'm intrigued. Yeah. And what about you? What's your cookie on hand? So before we started um, this Zoom <laughs> experience, I had to take a bite out of it first. I'm sorry. <laughs> it looked really good. I have an oatmeal cookie. Oh, nice. And so um, there's no raisins in it. I don't mind it with raisins, but if you don't have the raisins, I like it a little better. Understood. You know? And I have I have a glass of milk here too with the Tucson Museum of Art on there. Oh perfect. That you know we got a good combo going. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm glad you have the chocolate chip cookie. That's that's an American classic. I, I read somewhere that the lady who came up with the chocolate chip cookie sold the recipe to Nestle for a very small amount of money. Oh well, that wasn't very smart. <laughs> yeah, who knew it would take off like it did. I know, right? Yeah, that was my next question. It's like, is, are you a milk with cookie person? Like, you have to have milk with your cookie? I, I do like milk with my cookies. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah but, you I, know, if, if I have something else with it, like coffee or something, that's good, too. Perfect. Yeah. Maybe not orange juice or something like that. that yeah, it's too, yeah, it's too much acid for, for a dessert. <laughs> I think when I have the, the chocolate chip cookie, milk is fine, but I don't, it's not required. But when I have my ginger snaps, what tastes really good with this is a nice cold glass of, of apple cider. It's very, Ooh. yeah, it's very good. And very, All right. again, I want to come to your fall, house. Yeah, very fall, very New England like, like but uh, oh, it's so good. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, oh, you know, we are here to talk about art, too. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, though we love talking about cookies, obviously. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's just kind of start off with you maybe talking a little bit about yourself and what kind of work you do. You know, just, just tell us what you're thinking. Sure. Uh, well, I was... Uh, born and raised in New England, as you can tell by my ginger snap cookie. Um, and like many artists, like I grew up drawing in my sketchbooks and with colored pencils and all those crafty things kids do. 
Um, I didn't have many friends growing up. So like my sketchbooks were kind of my safe haven. I could go to my sketchbook and just kind of draw things that I love as a boy, like my favorite sports characters or my favorite toys or whatever, whatever you associate with a, with a child, I usually, oh, yeah. you know, drew in my books. Um, then in 93, my grandmother passed away and she had a very uh, slightly used oil painting kit in the closet. And my family seeing that I, you know, had an interest in the art, you know, art, sketchbooks, uh, they, gave, they gave the painting set to me and I remember trying, trying to use the paints for the first time and I was so frustrated. Like it was a new medium. I had no idea how to use this thick, you know, buttery new medium. Um, and I got so frustrated with it. I painted one painting and I put the rest away. I, I went back to my sketchbooks with drawing oh. because painting was very difficult for me <laughs> back then. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but I remember the, the one pleasant thing about the whole experience was how good the paint smelled. I just love the way the, when you take the cap off the oil paint tube, the, the paint just smelled so good. And when I, you know, when I, you know, when I use the same brand that I got, you know, 20, 25 years ago, smelling this paint reminds me of my grandmother. Just the, oh. the, the smell of the paint just reminds me of, of her. So, um, and, and luckily now I'm a little better with painting. So, <laughs> but um, I love that connection to, you know, your grandmother and your memory. Yeah. 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 So it's a nice little blast from the past to have that smell. I mean, I mean, you know, like smell is associated with memories in your brain. So when you smell something, Oh, that reminds me of, of this event or that reminds me of that. So, yeah. This paint reminds me of, of uh, my grandmother. So that's kind of a nice little touch there. Like that. Um, so yeah, so I didn't get back into painting seriously until I went to college. Because um, I had no one to really teach me how to use the platform. It was a very difficult thing to uh, understand, uh, wrap my head around. Um, so I went to school, uh, at a very small school in New Hampshire called Keene State. Um, they're known for their teaching program, but they had a really good film program as well. So I went there to be a film major, because I you know every teen kid like loves the movie, so why not try film? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, so I took a couple of courses in film and I realized I was not passionate about film like the other kids were. Like those kids were like film nerds. Like they were just like talking about the camera equipment and all the types of film they use. And I, and it was going over my head. I had no idea what they were talking about. Oh. So I realized I didn't have the passion for it. Um, so I switched my major to uh, graphic design and that's all on the computer. And I, I love using my hands. So I quickly gave that up. And then I switched it to architecture. And that was fun. My whole family is uh, carpenters and I saw my dad, you know, drawing blueprints growing up as a kid. So I thought that was kind of interesting to, you know, use your hands to draft out what you're going to build. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But, you know, these days computers are taking over all that. So nothing is hand drawn anymore. It's all on the software CAD, CAD software to make plans. Uh, so I, didn't like that either. Oh, so okay. Finally, so I make a long story short, I went uh, abroad to Australia for a study abroad program. And during that trip, I just realized, you know, you're, you live a short life, just do what you want to do that makes you happy. And you might be poor, you might be struggling, I don't know, but at least do something that makes you happy. So when I got back from Australia, I finally declared myself a studio art major because that's what I enjoy doing. I did it all through my childhood. I enjoy taking art classes in school. Um, and I just <laughs> did it. Yeah, you just went from there, right? <laughs> Declared myself a, ma a, a art major and went from there. And uh, luckily during the entire time in school, I was taking art, cor like art cor courses. So 
I wasn't too terribly behind. I had to stay back one extra semester because I kept changing my major so many times. Um, but finally I graduated and luckily right after school, I got a job in New Haven, Connecticut where they built architectural models for clients. So the, the architecture firm would hire our firm to build these really detailed immaculate uh, three, three dimensional models of the proposed project. And there was a really cool job. It, oh. was, it was using architecture, which I still had an interest in. And I was using my hands to build the, to build the, uh, build the models and I got to paint the models because you had to mimic like stone or grass or whatever kind of paper oh, using yeah. in the, uh, in the model. So that was pretty cool. I really enjoyed that job. Um, but I, I got burned out so bad. I could, working architecture field, like you work like 60, 80 hours a week. It was a very demanding job and I got burned out pretty fast. And, I bet. Uh, and so after two years of that, um, uh, a, a artist from Georgia moved from Georgia to Connecticut and he was looking for an artist assistant. So once I found the ad, I replied to it pretty quickly. And a month later I was working as his studio assistant and that was great. I was getting paid to paint all day. And that was, that was amazing. Oh, so wow. That about, did that for about two years. And um, my partner, Matt, got a job offer here in Denver. Uh, so I moved to Denver and I went full-time artist. So now I've been doing full-time art for about nine, ten years now. Well, I, I was looking at your resume and you have had solo shows you've, that are not just in the U.S., but abroad. You know, yeah. you've really, <laughs> you know, started something here in the past 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, I feel like it's really hard to succeed being an artist. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of good artists out there, but like a lot get un, under-recognized because they don't know how to market themselves or promote themselves. And I just kind of figured it out over the years. Like when I was working my day jobs, I would come home and I would paint at night times. Uh, on the weekends, I would paint as well. In addition to sending my stuff to magazines or online uh, magazines or just whoever would want to see work, I would just send it to them. And it's all about networking and just getting your Sometimes it really is about annoying people. Like you gotta just like, hey, here's me. Just show it, shove it in their faces. <laughs> you have to market yourself. Yeah. I know, I'm, and, it, and, it worked, and it worked out. And I'm pretty happy about that. So, you know, I guess that's a good segue um, to talk about how you and I became acquainted. Hmm. Um, so I was working on a show uh, called Western, The Western Sublime, Majestic mm -hmm. Landscapes of the American West. And I was putting together the exhibition and my colleague, Julie Saucy, who's the chief curator at the Tucson Museum of Art, uh, knew what I was looking for. And she received a postcard and came in my office and said, here, this looks like something you can, you mm -hmm. can look at for your show. And it was this really large piece, mm -hmm. um, uh, that was, I can't remember, a hundred and some inches long. Yeah, and it was, it was, I think it was 96 by uh, like 70s. It was, it was big. It, it was, was big. It was, it was big. big. <laughs> but I loved it because it was this traditional landscape with um, this like Photoshop erasure all across it. And I thought, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> and so I reached out to you. Awesome. Yeah. And I think from there, you and I were just corresponding. And, you know, you're a great person to respond to emails. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and and it, it turned into you creating a piece for that exhibition. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm just very thankful about that because sometimes artists aren't um, as willing to work you know, um, with, an, with a museum because they have very busy schedules or, you know, something. And it's very special when an artist says, hey, I'd love to work with you. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the museum, I think that the goal of a museum is to kind of preserve and protect and promote these works by global artists. So why not work with a museum? I mean, a museum is a really good platform to show your work. And so, yeah, I definitely agree to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, and, you know, like you said, you market yourself. So it seemed like a good opportunity, I bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, I think going, if I remember right, we tried to get that piece that you saw on the postcard for the show, but it was either sold already and it'd be too difficult to ship or it was just too, it, the, the, the logistics didn't work out for that big painting. It right. Was just, it was just too big. Right. So then we had the idea, let's make a piece specifically for the museum and that's and for, for the show. And that's what I did. Yep. And it makes it extra special too, you know? Yeah. So, you know, let's look at the piece. How about that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Let me pull it up here for just a moment. Okay. So this is the last exit, Valley of the Yosemite, Erasure number 27. That's right. Yep. That's the piece I made specifically for the Western Sublime show. And I, cho I chose this piece because, one, it's, it's a beautiful piece by Bierstadt. And it's, it's of, of the West. And since the museum is in the West and the, the show was about Western pieces. I figured I would choose something from the West. Well, yeah, it was a perfect <laughs> fit. Yeah. Yeah. And like you were saying, it was inspired by um, an original Albert Bierstadt piece from um, 1864 called Valley of the Yosemite. Yep. So you took this piece and created this piece. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there's actually an. Uh, Bierstadt did a lot of paintings uh, about uh, Yosemite. Like he was, he had a huge attraction to the West and the big majestic mountains of of the Rocky Mountains. And he painted the, the he painted Yosemite many times. Um, and he would he would take some liberties to like he would you know make mountains a little more bigger or more majestic. He would make the clouds more uh, mysterious, more ominous looking, um, but. What the way he captures landscapes is so uh, magical. And it was very hard to recreate this piece, like to capture his, his sort of technique. I mean, I had to do this several studies to get like the lighting correct, like the glow of the sun behind the, the mountain there. I had to do many stud studies to get that right. I mean, it's, it's very hard to capture a beer stat. Like he is a masterpiece, he's a master at painting landscapes. Yeah, of course. I mean, he's <laughs> among the best um, from the I mean, 19th it's century. A great challenge. It's a great challenge too, because you know, I, if you follow my work for the last you know, decade, I recreate paintings um, from America, like 18th century on upward. Um, and it's been a great learning tool to learn how to paint. Um, because in school, you, know, you learn how to, you learn like the basics like form and value and color theory and all that, but you really can't teach talent, I suppose the word is. Mm, okay. I, feel like what, I feel like what really helped me uh, be a technically good painter was to recreate paintings from, uh, from our past. So I think that's why I kind of, improve my skills from that, you know, being a nine-year-old, getting that, my grandmother's, grandmother's oil painting kit to now, to where I am now, like just mimicking uh, old paintings has really taught me a lot over the last decade. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell me about the erasure series and, and what, what it really means to have these squiggles across the screen, across the, these very pristine images? Yeah. So this, this piece is from my erasure series. And I, within this series, I create uh, paintings from within the White House art collection or iconic American paintings and superimpose on top white and gray erasure patterns on top, like you see in this painting here. Uh, in Photoshop, when you alter or move an image, this white and gray pattern uh, is exposed. Okay. So, 
with this series, I wanted to show how our American democracy is uh, is being erased right before our eyes. You know, for example, uh, the Par the Paris Climate Accord, which was I think canceled about three years ago. Um, I chose to to paint Bierstadt's uh, Yosemite Valley because I wanted the work to be of Western theme, since the museum is in the West, mm -hmm. as well as be as well as a environmental awareness painting. Uh, that, the, that the policies protecting the lands and clean water and clean air are being erased, you know, because of the our current government. They're just they're they're taking away. They they're not really focused on environmental policies. So I want so I chose this painting to this beautiful majestic painting to, you know, sort of damage or erase it because sure. you know, we're, losing, we're losing these protections that protect the lands and you know, these sacred lands. Sure, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So let's talk about your larger body of work. So what drives you to create the work that you do? I know you don't always do landscapes. I know you do portraits and still lifes like you have behind you. Yeah. Um, so you have branched out in many ways, but what drives you to create the work you do? What what inspires you or motivates you? Well, back back in the day when I was in school and right after school, I would paint things that I thought were pretty. Like they were like uh, beautiful things that went unnoticed. So maybe a storefront or an old car, or something kind of mundane, kind of boring that you've seen a thousand times. Um, so, I'll kind of segue to something real quick. Yeah. I went, about about 10, 10 years ago, I went camping with my cousin, and he's a he's a teacher. He's a very sharp mind. He he's also very critical. So we were camping, and uh, he's like, "Hey, Sean, you're really great at painting, but you don't paint faces. Like, you are you are you afraid to paint, you know, portraits?" And I was like, "Well, I think you're right. I." I paint everything. I, I was very confident in my painting skills, but I would avoid painting portraits. Oh. Uh, I, didn't have any, I didn't have any training in school. Like I didn't take a portrait painting class specifically for portraits. So painting portraits was pretty intimidating for me. Uh, so that weekend when I got home from camping, I, to prove my cousin wrong that I could paint portraits, I would uh, practice by replicating old 18th century American portraits. For example, from, from Copley or Gilbert Stewart. Uh, so I would use those, I would recreate those paintings to teach me how to paint portraits. And of course, the first ones were absolute crap and terrible. Uh, but I figured it out at some point. I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out as well. Like it's, it's been 10 years since I created my first portrait. And I feel like I'm still learning new things with each portrait. I think that's important though, that artists never feel that they know everything and that they can evolve and learn. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like a, it's a journey. Like you're learning new things, with each painting, learning things about how to paint, learning things about yourself, learning things about what to say. Yeah. So it's a very, it's a very long, tedious, but joyful journey. Uh, so it's, it's fun. Sure. Um, so yeah, so one of, my, one of the paintings, that I, one of my test paintings slipped beneath a piece of paper that had the acronym LOL on it. And I thought that was kind of a neat contrast with the old portrait with our current day, with our current day uh, texting from your digital phones. Right. So maybe this could be an interesting series uh, to, go, to ask more questions about. So I went from like these mundane sort of storefronts and old cars to actually making work that actually had a statement behind it. Okay. So I, so I created my first text painting, which is a portrait of George Washington with the acronym R-O-F-L, which means rolling on the floor laughing. I mean, it's kind of it's a little goofy, but I mean, it kind of, it contrasts our, the, the old ways of living versus our current day of living. And I wanted to ask the questions about how our, how our ways, how our way of communicating has changed over the centuries. Um, 
So with that series, like there's a way, like how we talk to each other through our phones, is it more intimate than it was? Like is, is the way we talk over phones, is it more intimate than a handwritten letter or talking to somebody on, on the phone, like an actual phone call? Sure. Like I, like I, like I can send a text message to you right now and I get there in a heartbeat. Um, and a letter back then would take maybe, maybe months to get from point A to point B, but I feel like the, 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 way, the, the sentiment in that letter was more valuable in that letter. It was more emotional. It was, it was more coherent mm -hmm. than a quick text. So, so I want to contrast the way we communicate with you know, the, how our forefathers communicated way back when. So, I, so this new series was actually saying something behind it besides you know painting an old storefront this new series was kind of actually asking questions and making you think about you know as is, is our is the way we is the way we communicate you know valuable i mean is it is it uh, intimate like for example like when you go to a restaurant do you put your phone away or are you, do you have your phone with you the whole time ah like so, we when my partner when my partner and I go to a restaurant, our phones are off; they're in our pockets. We want to have a, a a genuine conversation without the distraction of our phones. So oh, I feel nice! Like, so I feel like this the new body the text work was really developing my my sense my voice as an artist to 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 say something. Right, and you're saying it with a sense of humor too. <laughs> right, right. Like, yeah, I've never been a serious person, so uh, I wanted to say something meaningful, but also make it kind of funny. So it's kind of a win-win situation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you can't you can't get out of your head like buffering the buffering uh, symbol on on a late, on a regal lady's portrait, or right. like you said, or <laughs> roll on the floor laughing, you know, with this very serious, you know. Right, right, yeah. I mean, the nineteenth century like, portrait. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the contrast is so is so striking. I I feel like, like these very stoic, very uh, prominent figures, uh, with this like goofy, you know, funny texting over the face. It's it's funny, but it also kind of makes fun of us of how are we actually really saying these things? Like, this is how we communicate today. I mean, it's kind of <laughs> it's right. Kind of funny, <laughs> I mean, technology is, is wonderful. Like it's like, we're able to communicate right now. Like you're in Arizona, I'm in Colorado. Technology is wonderful, but I also feel like technology is really kind of distracting from what's really important in life. For example, I, one of my hobbies is fiddling. I love to fiddle, learn to fiddle. Um, but if I get on an Instagram you know, tangent, like I'll be on Instagram for like a half an hour and I'll waste critical time learning something, you know, impactful or, you know, right. Technology is very distracting to say the least. Well, well put. I think <laughs> there is, there is that happening with our culture today. You're right. You're right. So, you know, that makes me think um, about the lasting power of your work. So let's say 20 years from now, we're not texting anymore and we're not using LOLs anymore. How do you feel your work will continue to have impact? You mean the current work I'm doing now? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's the artist's job to record their current surroundings that affect them personally uh, and have some things that, and some things that you create may stand as, May, may stand this test of time and others won't. But right. I think it's what's most important to an artist is to, is to create work that's true and honest with themselves. And if, and if that means it doesn't hold up in 10 years, then, then whatever. You just have to, <laughs> the, the artist has to, be, has to be here in the now, in the moment, and create something that well, I think if it's impactful, 
uh, create something that's recording something that's happening in your life that's impactful to other people. I think that's what makes work strong is that it's, it creates a dialogue between you know, myself and you and the viewers. Uh, for example, the, the erasure painting. Yeah, it's a pretty painting with a graffiti like strike across the middle, but it also has a deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, if we're not using Photoshop in 10, 10, 20 years, and people have no idea what the, what that pattern is, well, then that's what it is. But in the, in the, in that moment, that's how I felt. That's what I, that's what I wanted to say in that moment. Yeah. So, so I feel like art is to record what you're, what the artist's experience experiences. Right. I mean, Andy Warhol's Campbell's soup cans still have lasting power, don't they? Absolutely. And we're still eating C Campbell's soup. I mean, they're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't see people anymore wearing these big frills around their necks or these intricate lace patterns, but you know, people are still around. So yes, trends change, uh, people change, um, but it recorded that moment in time and i feel like that's worth keeping if it, if it records that moment then it's worth saving yeah agreed agreed so i have seen your instagram which you do a great job of showing your artistic process but could you tell us a little bit about how you put work together and what your creative process is like sure uh my process generally begins on the computer. So I will take an image, for example, the Bierstadt painting, and I will just have fun on the computer, play around with the computer. Uh, if it's with text, the text series, I'll play around with text, text size, text font styles. Um, so when I, get the, when I get the composition right on the computer and I'm, and I'm satisfied with it, I will draw onto a white canvas. Uh, and from there, the computer is no longer, the computer is complete, complete out of the picture. And I'll draw the, draw the painting on a white canvas. And if it's, if it's texting, I'll mask off the text with white tape at the very beginning to retain the white of the canvas. Uh, same with the erasure, I'll, I'll tape off the, the white swirl of the, of the erasure at the beginning. Okay. And then on top of that, I'll do an underpainting. This is the one thing I learned in school, uh, is to do a nice, warm uh, underpainting so you can see those nice, warm glows uh, beneath the final layers of paint. Okay. So there'll be, there'll be an underpainting, and then on top of the underpainting, there'll be the final layers of paint. Uh, once the painting is complete, I'll remove the tape uh, from the painting to reveal the text or reveal the, the, the erasure marks. Uh, and then finalize the painting from there, either by you know making the white edges crisp, or adding the the gray checkered pattern uh, in the in the erasure series, uh, and then photograph it and then varnish it. <laughs> you so, make yeah. it sound so easy, <laughs> <laughs> and then well, you I've... do this, and then you do this, and you're done. <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> Well, I do it every day, so it's like so it's my routine. So like, there's some things that you do that I would be like a foreign language language to me. Uh, like Matt, my partner Matt, he is a states professional, and uh, he he's like talking in code when he's like speaking to me in these like acronyms. Like I, I have no idea what he's saying, but it's that's his language. Right. Like that's how he speaks. How I speak is through my paintings. And so I have a, I'm very routine based. I have this step and then this step and then that step and then it's done. Right. So, so I just kind of figured out how to streamline my process because I have um, a lot of opportunities right now. So I have to kind of figure out how to, you know, best use my time. And I, I kind of figured out how to speed up the process without diminishing the work. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> hey, it's it's your it's your life, it's your career, it's it's who you are. <laughs> right? <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that, that's been 
very helpful to me over the years is, is really uh, creating a routine for myself. Uh, so my, my studio is at home. Uh, so we, you have to establish a routine and, and boundaries of how to work at home. Uh, like for people working at home from the current pandemic, uh, people are trying to figure out how to work from home. Like it's, I'm sure you have struggled with this. Like how do right. I create a routine where I can get my work done and not be procrastinating? Right. And me working from home, I've learned over the, over the last 10 years how to successfully manage my career uh, while working from home. So I, so I base my secret is just to make a routine. Like you stick to it every day. Uh, so my routine quickly is I get up around 5.30 in the morning, I'll exercise, have breakfast, then, I'll, then I'm in the studio from 7.30 until 4 p.m. Ooh. Like those are my hours. Like I do studio stuff. If I'm not painting, I'm marketing, if I'm, I'm running emails, I'm doing studio stuff in yeah. that time frame. And then four o'clock beyond, I do, you know, whatever, fiddle or whatever. But my studio is on the second floor. So the second floor is the work zone. So oh. when I walk upstairs, I'm at work. I'm professional. I'm, I'm serious, you know. And then when I go back down the stairs, that's my personal life. I talk with friends. I'm fiddling. I'm doing, I'm doing whatever you do on your free time. Yeah. I like that, how you kind of keep the two separated, but it's still your yeah. life. It's still, right. yeah, that's exactly. great. And if, I, and if I don't follow these rules, I don't create paintings. I don't, I don't sell work. I don't, I don't have gallery shows. Like I, I have to do this. Otherwise, I'm, I'm a bum. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I commend you for such a routine. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Well, I've read many numerous articles about like what do successful people do and most of them say is a routine like they they stick to a routine and they you know they they're they're very adamant about sticking to it and they've also a couple of people have said that you know <laughs> what makes you successful is that you wear the same thing every day. So, you know, like Steve Jobs, for example, he wears black turtlenecks. Right. Mark Zuckerberg, you know, he's known for his hoodies. Uh, for me, my wardrobe is a white t-shirt and blue pants. Like that is what I wear every single day. Like I have the, you know, Ernest P. Worrell, the, uh, the, the, the movie guy. Um, anyways, he has like the, I, I, I make fun myself because I had the Ernest P. Worrell wardrobe where you had the same wardrobe. He has like 20 outfits and it's all the same exact thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my outfit. Like it's just a white t-shirt with blue khakis so every day. Hey, you know, whatever works for you. It works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, so why don't you tell me a little bit about what kind of project you're working on lately? Sure. So opening in two weeks, I have a solo show at K Contemporary here in Denver, and I'm debuting a brand new body of work. It's kind of something like behind me, something like that, but that's not for the show. Uh, but basically what I'm doing for the show, well, the show is called uh, Fool's Errand. Um, and you know what a fool's errand is, like you're, you're doing something when you expect nothing in return, or you know you're, you're knowingly doing this because it's, it's wrong or it's not, it's a mistake. Like you're doing this without no avail. So basically I'm, this new work is still recreating old works from the 18th century American time period, but uh, I'm manipulating them by adding uh, pieces of Roman sculpture or these disembodied hands that you kind of see the, the piece behind me, adding these really creepy ghostly hands within the painting oh. um, and this this new body of work kind of runs parallel with the erasure series uh, but instead of erasing the painting i'm kind of i'm manipulating the, the painting now um, so i'm using roman sculpture i wish i had a painting to show you I, everything that i just had in the studio was shipped out just yesterday so i have really nothing to show um, 
but basically you're a busy guy it's okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> so i'm using roman sculpture on top of a portrait of just say george washington for example and, I, and i'm using the sculpture as a preemptive warning of a failed society um, and i'm using the disembodied hands as a metaphor of our current day uh, manipulations of the past, you know, such oh. as the behind me. Um, mm. Even innocent, you know, still life gets, you know, warped and manipulated. Yeah. Uh, so what I wanted to say with this new work is um, it focuses on our relationships with the past and how it affects our current state of the world and our place in it. Um, and, it you know, and the series features a collection of paintings um, challenging the idea of learning from previous mistakes and what happens when those lessons go unfulfilled. So, you know, for example, so I feel like this new work is kind of relevant right now because we're in the pandemic of COVID. Um, so it kind of, we're not learning from our previous mistakes of uh, pandemic uh, handling, you know, we're kind of, for, we're, we're forgetting how things used to, used to work. <clears throat> excuse me we're not we're not we're not learning from our from our mistakes so, so this body of work is kind of showing how we're not we're yeah we're not you know we're we're dummies right now or <laughs> we're not yeah we're we're relearning things yeah right right exactly and and we're making mistakes and we're learning from those and hopefully those lessons go fulfilled if not then we're gonna start over we're gonna be in the same boat we were before right yeah so, so yes yeah, so, i'm sorry so this so this new body of work debuts in two weeks and i have two new solos in the fall time one in october one in november mm. so that's why i have all these blank canvases around me is to uh <laughs> to get to work for those <laughs> okay so you have some things lined up I do, I do. <laughs> Has the COVID-19 pandemic in, influenced your work, um, your work ethic, your work process? How, you know, what kind of impact has it had? Uh, nothing has really changed. Like, like I mentioned before, I work from home. I, I, I'm luckily, luckily, lucky to have a studio in the house. So I, I can come upstairs and do my normal routine. So nothing in that regard has changed. The only change is that my partner Matt works from home now. Mm, okay. Uh, so so he comes in every now and then for the uninvited critique hour. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so so he'll come in and be like, "What's that? I don't understand." And I, I'm I'm like, "Okay, please leave. It's not done yet." <laughs> you know. Right. So so that's the only kind of thing that's changed is the the critique hour, but that has kind of changed i told him i don't like doing that i don't like when he comes in <laughs> oh okay when I'm, in the, when I'm in the zone i can't be disturbed uh, if, if i'm running emails whatever come in but if i'm like zoned into a painting i'm like thinking about that painting and i yeah can't entertain any conversation at that time <laughs> i mean it sounds and, like a and that's the way you work that's okay yeah that's how it is. <laughs> yeah. So how, so how, speaking of the pandemic, like how has a museum, uh, you know, changed its policies or changed its programming to, you know, show it's, to show art to people who can't really go out to the public? How is a museum adapting to the pandemic? We are working on our online platforms for sure, um, including this interview with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we want to bring the collection forward for people to access from their homes. Um, and when we are open, we're looking to, you know, engage with um, social distancing restrictions and limiting amounts of people in each gallery. Mm. Um, so there are many things that we are working on with that. It's, and there are so many questions rather than answers you know, trying to work things out. Right. Um, but I think our main thing is to make sure that people know that the museum is there and that um, we do offer things that even though if you're not in the building, 
we are still a resource. Awesome. Yeah. So Great. that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, like I said, we I, I have a show opening in two weeks and this is their first, like the, my gallery had to close for the last three or four months or three months because of the pandemic. And this is their first show that they're doing where the public can come in, but we're still trying to figure out how to do that. Like limited amount of visitors in the gallery at one time, uh, signing up for time slots, uh, you know, wear a face mask and, you know, the distancing part. So this is the first uh, show that the gallery is showing with the new pandemic rules in place. So it's going to be new for me how, because usually at an opening, I'm there shaking hands, talking with many people about my work and, you know, whatever you do on a, at an opening night. Uh, so this is going to be a, 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 a new experience in two weeks to see how this opening goes with Definitely. the new regulation. So I'm kind of nervous about it because uh, you, 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 an artist gets energy from the people coming in. Um, so there's only like 10 people in at a time. I mean, it, it is what it is. Like you have to work with what, what you got, but um, absolutely, it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it pans out. Right. So, we'll Only see. time will tell. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. So is there anything you would like to talk about? <laughs> or do you want to just eat your cookie or two? Uh, well, I, I actually want to know how is the museum uh, construction going? Like how oh is it my thing? goodness! I, I see. I see from your uh, from the museum's Instagram, mm -hmm. the new renderings and the, the the new walk around. That was a pretty cool, like virtual tour of inside the new wing. So how is the construction going? Oh, it's going really well. We are um, looking to open uh, the new wing in July. Mm. Uh, and so my gosh you know just walking through the new wing um with our hard hats on of course sure it's just a very impressive building and we can hardly wait to start putting our ancient latin american art in there oh it's, beautiful it's gonna be beautiful it's gonna look so good in there <laughs> you're gonna have to make your way back to arizona to see it absolutely i i love tucson tucson is really pretty cute quaint little city I, I loved it there yeah it is a fun place and yeah. you know tucson museum of art is always there <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so yeah. well you know it's been a pleasure talking with you yeah, and you learning too. more about your work and so you know i just i hope that things continue to go well for you and your career and your you know very strict methods of yes <laughs> working because that that is what you know you can thrive with your artistic process yeah absolutely so, yeah i mean right. uh, well, speaking of routines like i get emails here and there asking like sean what like what do you recommend to younger artists just starting off like what do you what do you have to say to them and I just gotta say, like, you just gotta work hard. If you if you believe in it, you just gotta work work your butt off, because you're because no one's gonna give it to you. Like I I had no one to give me a solo show. I I mean I, I worked my butt off to get where I am right now, and that routine making a routine is really is really important. I feel like if you're working a nine to five job, your routine is working nine to five, and then maybe you're working three hours at night. Right. And, your work uh so the routine is 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 key to success and like in any any profession i think a routine is is key yep and dedication for sure yeah, yeah absolutely well thank you for talking with me today oh, thank you for having me i i really enjoy this <laughs> yeah enjoy your cookies oh absolutely <laughs> <laughs> all right well i'm signing off this is Christine Brinza from the Tucson Museum of Art with Sean Huckins. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you.